So welcome to everyone. Welcome to Despicable Weeds. I am going to turn things over to Bob Lang, our natural area steward at the Portage Park District. And I think you'll enjoy learning from him tonight and learning more about some of the invasive plant species in our area. The floor is yours, Bob. Okay. Jen, thank you so much. That was uh, too kind. I'm really happy to, to work here and to work with you. I'm so happy that so many folks have joined us here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, so as Jen said, I'm going to talk about these invasive plants that we fight here at the Park District. And they truly are, to me, despicable weeds. Um, it's an ongoing battle. Um, just kind of as an outline for, for tonight, I'd like to maybe go through um, the, you know, the definitions of invasive plants and the problems they cause. Um, then we'll break into some of the invasive plants that we control here at Portage Park District and, and give you some background on each species a little and a little bit about the control methods we use and and what's a big part of what I you know keep on my mind is prioritizing what we work on and so I'll jump right to it um, definitions of invasive plants um, these, if you search on Google or look at various literature, you'll find numerous definitions for invasive plants or invasive species. Um, you know, and this first one here from the Natural Resource Conservation Service um, really hits home with me and what we do here at the Park District, trying to preserve our, our uh, natural heritage and maintain it. Uh, you know, um, non-native plants that establish on many sites, they grow fast, spread fast, spread easily, and disrupt our, our native plant communities. Um, but then if we go a little further, and back to 1999, the executive order from the president, um, and this is a little more far reaching and with invasive species in general, not just plants. Um, you know, non-native alien to the ecosystem who cause uh, economic or environmental harm or direct harm to human health. I'm actually, the timing of my career is interesting because uh, I've, I've worked in this field since the late 1990s uh, and early on in my career is, you know, around late 80s, mid 90s is when um, especially invasive plants kind of came to the forefront and be started to become a, a major part of the workload for conservation agencies. Um, you know, so invasive plants, um, as kind of by these definitions, they um, grow very successfully, they spread easily, and that's hand in hand with why they are so invasive. Um, they go into these ecosystems that they're not from those those systems, uh, you know, they don't have the same natural interactive components with the, to, you know, to exist with these invasive species, invasive plants. Um, they're, they're really opportunistic. They, they quickly establish in disturbed sites. So be it a human caused disturbance, uh, land clearing or, or land disturbance, or perhaps after a flood or a major natural event, um, that's the time often where when invasive species will first show up on a site. They grow very quickly, outcompete our native plants. Uh, once they're established in a site, they can uh, hinder the native plants that are already there and, and certainly um, hamper any effort for more native plants to establish. Um, in, in general, they, they compete with plants for moisture, light, nutrients, other resources. Um, plant diversity is basically decreased. It certainly reaches further than just affecting plants, that, then it also can affect wildlife and the habitat for the wildlife. They can increase soil erosion. Definitely they affect recreation. If anybody's a boater and has experienced uh, an area with, with heavy curly pond weed or, or even worse yet, hydrilla, uh, 
it can affect recreation. Um, but, but most importantly, all the impacts of invasive plants really um, can change nature's balance, um, you know, which all other species depend upon. So these effects on biodiversity and on nature's balance, um, you know, the plants are in, to them, the invasive plant is in the foreign environment and it, it can wreak havoc on the biological processes that occur um, in a given ecosystem. And this is often found, in, and I'll quote it from US Forest Service, invasive species have contributed to the decline of over 40% of um, all species that are listed as endangered or threatened. And of those 18%, of the invasive species have been the main cause of, of the decline to begin with. So that brings me more to what I also focus on is rare plants. And, and I'd like to talk a little bit about, so that effect on biodiversity and, and, and affecting rare species. And the first thing that comes to mind when I think about things being imperiled or maybe being lost in the natural world is a quote from one of my favorites, um, Aldo Leopold, um, who says, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution to intelligent tinkering. And I'll paraphrase really um, some background on, on when he wrote that and what went along with that statement. Um, you know, every piece of a given ecosystem is important, even, even if we don't really even know why yet in, a, in a, an entirely native, natural given habitat, um, each thing plays a role. And when we, when we lose a species, we lose a component to that system. Um, and really that begins a trickle down effect that can affect another plant and another animal and another species. Um, we, we really need to keep our biodiversity. Um, and, and then even more direct impacts with the loss of species. Um, when you think about 40% um, or more maybe of all medicine in the, in the Western world is derived from plants. So going back to what Aldo Leopold said about needing to keep all of our pieces, even if we don't know what roles they play yet, um, once a species is gone, it's gone. We, we may never know if it could have contained the cure for an illness or uh, benefit us, us as humans some, some other way down the road. So I'll let it go at that on my rant about invasive plants on a, on a larger scale and, and direct scale. Um, but just know that, I mean, they really can be viewed as ecological pollution um, once they're in a site. It's really, really no different than uh, say, you know, oil being spilled into a freshwater system. I mean, those effects are immediate and direct and have a lasting impact. You know, when an invasive plant comes into an ecosystem, it may not seem all that bad at first. And then, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, we find out it's been causing almost irreversible harm. Um, so I'll, I'll get moving on with my slideshow a little bit there. I, I uh, think I'll just kind of pull it down more into just directly talking about invasive plants and bring it down to more of a local level. Here in Ohio, there are 38 uh, plant species listed as, in, as invasive in Ohio. Um, that was established in 2018 with an official uh, listing by the state. Um, here at Portage Park District, we, we work, I, I'm gonna ballpark and say, we work on about 20 different invasive plant species per year when it comes to control and monitoring. Um, and interestingly enough, um, a handful of those are actually not on the state's invasive plant list yet, which is somewhat unsettling. But what I'd like to do now is just take a look at about 10 invasive plants that we work on here all the time at Portage Park District. Um, and I'm going to break them down into herbaceous plants and woody invasive plants. So as you can see on the screen there, I have our despicable herbaceous 
invasive plants, which I have found that can be quite a tongue twister. But the first one we're gonna look at is lesser celandine. And I've, I've kind of ordered these here uh, more or less along with the seasonality of when we need to watch for these plants and when we can control these plants. So here's lesser celandine. Um, it's a really pretty little plant, kind of uh, to, to a lot of people really a new invasive or at least one that hadn't been focused on much till about the last 10 or 15 years. Um, it's an escaped garden plant it was brought into the United States as an ornamental from, uh, let's see, from Europe, Africa, and Asia. And around the 1800s. But the, this plant is one of the first things to emerge in the spring, which is part of what makes it so dangerous. It, it invades our um, floodplain areas. It does like to have its feet just a little bit wet. So floodplains, marginal areas, damp woods, uh, you know, drainages, ditches. It emerges really early, around, around March, April. These little green leaves will start to break up through the leaf layer. Um, they average, the leaves average about the size of a penny, really glossy on top, low growing plant, you know, on average four to six inches tall. It can be a, definitely be a little taller, but that's just the average. And then usually by, mm, early through mid-April starts to bloom, has these nice, shiny, beautiful little yellow flowers with eight to 12 petals. Um, and so I can see why people would have wanted it in their gardens. Certainly it's not the worst thing to look at, but it's very brief. This, this plant can complete its whole growth cycle in just a couple of months. It, it's, it's blooming here in April into May and Typically, by the first week of June, there's almost nothing left of this plant. Uh, leaves, flowers, anything. It just senesces and seems to go away after it's done its thing. The, the problem lies with its spread. Um, along the stem, in this photo here, you'll see uh, along the stem, and then and it has these little bulbils, these little rudimentary bulbs that, that grow on the axles of the stem pretty prolifically and they fall off. So in controlling this plant, if we try to dig, and you can see one here that, that I had dug up a few years ago, and along with those bulbs along the stem, it has these little tubers. Um, so in digging the plant up, trying to do the right thing, get rid of it, you can also cause the spread. If you don't get all of those bulbs or you, you pull the plant out and shake it and the little bulbs go everywhere, um, And, and that actually can lead to spread to all those bulbs. You know, if you think about somebody has a little patch in their garden and somebody comes along with a leaf blower or a snow plow and now they've kind of smeared that plant and the bulbs have all spread even further out, um, you know, maybe some foot traffic through here, they'll drag it down the trail. This is, this is Headwaters Trail in, in Manaway. Um, we found this population about three years ago and we did a little investigating. Sure enough, I, I walked up where the trail goes through the backyards of some much older homes and, and there were their yards and flower beds just full of this plant. And they had, you know, the plant had more or less spilled down the hill like a waterfall and spread here along the trail. So typically when we get bigger patches of this, um, the herbicides, our best option to get quick control of it. But, um, you know, the problem is it's filling up space right when our native um, ephemeral flowers are trying to start growing. And it grows right where most of them do in the rich woods and the, and the damp soil. So it's competing for space. Just a really bad plant. It, it just spreads so quickly. 
So I really want people to make note of this one. Keep an eye out this spring for this beautiful yellow plant because it's, it's, it's really bad. <laughs> it's despicable. Here you can see a patch of it popped up in the middle of an upland area at Kent Bog. We managed to catch on to it and, and treat it with herbicide. It's really surprising. So that's the first one we look out for. And then quickly right after we move into garlic mustard season. And I know some are probably familiar with this plant. It's, it's been a great topic over the last uh, 20 years or so, 25 years. So this plant is a, is a biennial. It completes its life cycle in, in just two years. The first year, as you see on the right, it's really a smaller rosette. And, and a little disclaimer here, that actually is a second year plant. But uh, my point being the first year, it's low to the ground like that with just a few leaves. And then in the second year of growth, uh, the plant bolts, sets blossoms, produces seed, and then dies. The problem is it produces a lot of seed. And this, this, is, this is one of those invasive plants that has those far-reaching effects. Um, and this was really figured out about 10 years ago. Um, we have a native butterfly in, in these parts, the West Virginia white. You can see a photo of it here eating on that uh, toothwort flower. So what we've discovered, it's been discovered, um, the West Virginia white typically feeds on our native toothworts. It lays its eggs on those plants. The, the larva will develop, larva develop in there and, and perpetuates the species. For some reason, um, the adults have started to lay eggs on garlic mustard. Garlic mustard definitely invades uh, the same places as our uh, typical rich wood spring ephemerals. And so this butterfly species is attracted and laying its eggs on the garlic mustard. The larval uh, butterfly then tries to feed on garlic mustard, which ultimately is toxic and it kills the larva. So garlic mustard's just become a population sink for the West Virginia white. Here in this slide, you can see uh, we have our two leaf toothwort, uh, smooth rock crest, cut leaf toothwort. Those are all native plants that this butterfly typically would use to, for a part of its life cycle and for feeding. Um, but over here, we can see one feeding on, on garlic mustard. So one good thing about garlic mustard is it can be controlled by polling. Uh, a lot of groups get out and do polling. It, it takes repeated years. Uh, any kind of control of garlic mustard needs, needs to happen for a good seven to 10 years in a given area. Uh, the seeds are viable for seven to 10 years. So that you know once a plant has first come in and set seed on a site, uh, that, that seed's going to be in the soil and potentially can sprout um, over a seven to 10 year period. Seeds, seeds come in the form of a pod. You can see on, on the right there, we have almost mature pods. And then by early to mid June, the pods dry out. As you can see on the left, they split and thousands of seeds just kind of fly about around the plant. Here we can see there are some past polling efforts. Um, if the plant is pulled for control, it really needs to be bagged up and removed from site or bagged up and tied very tightly, allowed to rot in the sun. I know we've done that with it at times if we have a place to allow that to happen. Um, but it definitely shouldn't be left on site. Early on, when people started working to control this plant, they would pull big piles and leave them in the woods. And the plant's really tenacious because even with its roots out of the ground, it, it still manages to find enough moisture and, and, and air that the, the flower heads will actually curl up towards the sun. Even if you've left them laying on their side, they'll continue to bloom, continue to set seed. Uh, so we always remove it from site. Uh, 
Sometimes the bags, some agencies just bury the bags. But what we're faced with sometimes in the conservation field is trying to control such large areas of it, we, we simply can't rely just on hand pulling. The plant is a biennial. So once it's bolded in the setting of flower, you have to remember that's that's the last year for, for that particular plant. Um, it's, it's completing its life cycle. So oftentimes we can go in when there's masses of garlic mustard in blooming, we let it get pretty far along, just start to make immature seeds and we can go in with the weed eater and, and mow it down. That'll, that'll help knock the stand back. And, if, and occasionally we do come in with some herbicide to control the plant, um, especially if we, we fear it's threatening a very important habitat. Uh, typically when garlic mustard season comes to an end, I kind of mix my slides up there. Um, reed canary grass is typically the next herbaceous invasive plant we worry about. Um, and this, this one really, it's, it's, boy, it's just one of the ones I, I really get kind of irritated with. It invades just about everywhere. It definitely is a bad invasive plant in our wetland ecosystems, um, but it can jump out into our old fields, um, into say meadow restorations where we're trying to establish nice stands of native herbaceous plants. This can be a little bit of a pest, but definitely the, the greatest problem is in our wetlands, especially floodplains. Uh, riparian areas, it can just go in and, and dominate the surface. And it just produces a lot of biomass. And year after year, you get this buildup of duff, and that prevents other plants from growing, um, affects the hydrology. But it's about a three to four foot tall grass uh, from Europe and Asia that was originally promoted for erosion control and uh, forage production. And the sad part is it, it's one of those plants that's not on Ohio's list of invasive plants. And it's actually still sold in uh, seed supply stores. I've, I've been in feed mills and seen entire 50 pound sacks of reed canary grass seed sitting right next to other agricultural forage uh, species. So it's, it's tough to fight, but we try to keep it definitely out of our metal restorations and our, our um, definitely our more sensitive wetland habitats. There's a little telltale cue to identify reed canary grass. If you bend the leaf back right at the axle there, you'll, you'll see right down where the leaf meets the stem, there's a little what's called a ligule, a little rudimentary leaf there um, that is clear. And so that's a cue for IDing the plant. And then also just these flower heads that you saw in this first picture, kind of yellow like a canary. They start out when they first bloom, they're more or less kind of purple. And then, then as we get into say, uh, early June, mid June, they, they mature and they branch out, open up a little more and begin to get a little more blonde colored. Uh, the pollen from it is terrible. We, we go out to control this plant, either, either cutting or, or herbicide. And um, some people actually have a pretty bad reaction to it. So we're cognizant of that. And here's what it looks like in winter. Maybe this is familiar to some. You, know, you drive down the road and you see this uh, really bright, dormant yellow masses of grass uh, along the roads and then old fields. And even here, we can see that uh, this is at one of the streams here at Morgan Park off of Babcock Road. Um, all of that bright yellow grass mixed into the, the uh, shrub layer up to the creek's edge. That's all reed canary grass, and it's pretty much choked out all the other herbaceous vegetation in that area. But more often than not, we, we do treat this plant with herbicide. There's some, um, it's nice to get out and try to treat it before the seed heads mature. Um, but it, I, 
as I've mentioned a couple times, an integrated approach is always best. It can reduce some of the use of herbicides and increase um, the effectiveness. So when this plant blooms uh, at the end of May, it is helpful to go in and actually, if possible, if it's especially smaller patches, go in and trim the, the seed heads off before you treat it, or even to just mow it down, uh, wait till later in the season and come back and spray the regrowth. Um, you're, you're essentially spraying the plant or treating the plant in a more weakened state. So now I'll jump back because I had my little mix up there with the slides and get back to the cattails. Uh, this really we work on after reed canary grass typically. We have a native cattail, of course, we have native cattails here in Ohio and here in the United States, and we still have them here. Unfortunately, we have a narrow leaf cattail also. Um, and to make matters worse, um, you know, it hybridizes with our native cattail. So then we wind up with another uh, invasive species, the hybrid cattail. And you can see here just how dense it can be. Um, and this, this slide here, this is our native cattail. It's got wider leaves. And you'll notice the plants are spaced out a little more. I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a patch, but there's space in between each plant. And why, why that is, is there's a, a native boar that, that feeds on our native cattail, a nice uh, native interaction we have here in this ecosystem. The problem is that boar does not feed on, on the non-native narrow leaves or the hybrid cattail. So, um, that allows those invasive cattails to grow much, much more densely and, and uh, degrade our habitats much more, uh, keeping our natives sub, uh, subdued. A quick little ID tip here, um, you'll see on the left uh, is both pictures on the left are our are, are native cattail. You have the female and male flower parts on the stem and they, they both touch, they, they meet, there's no space in between them. And uh, the photo second from the right is narrow leaf cattail. You'll see there's a large gap between the male and female parts of the flower all the way to the right. Um, here's a hybrid cattail, the male flowers gone, but you can still see that there was a green gap between there. Um, so if, in IDing it, if we combine that we have this gap between the flower parts and growth, say like this, where there's nothing but cattails to be seen, and these are not flowering at this time, but that is all cattail and non-native, and that's um, just what it does, being that it doesn't have any, any native components here. It just gets really dense, it alters hydrology, it, um, suppresses our native plants. So when we get to a stage like this, it's usually time for herbicide. It's very effective. Here's, I believe at that same site, an herbicide application this summer that was actually Manaway Bog State Nature Preserve, part of a co-op day with um, Division of Natural Areas and some other partners. And that's really more kind of a large scale control effort, but um, cattails on a small scale, if you have a new small wetland, maybe rain garden, and you notice that uh, some non-native cattail is starting to come in there and you fear it's going to um, hurt your native plantings, it can be pulled in the first year, as they say in the radish stage, the, the first shoots of that plant when they're low six, eight inches, they usually pull out pretty easily. Um, another, another good control measure in a larger wetland, like the one we saw here in this photo, if say we were able to control the water level, which we were not able to in this particular setting, but um, when you can in the fall, if you can lower the water level, go in and cut all of the cattails and then uh, raise the water level back up to, 
to submerge those top stems. Essentially, the, the tubers, the plant will suffocate over the winter. And then our last herbaceous weed we're going to talk about here is maybe one I would imagine everybody has seen alongside the roads. This is uh, Phragmites, a uh, common reed. Really, really tall, dense grass, mostly in, invading our wetlands, spreading in moist ditches, uh, small depressions. A really bad invader for our wetlands, degrading our wetland systems and very common, unfortunately. So this was along Nicodemus Road here uh, about five years ago here at Morgan Park, or I'm sorry, Babcock Road. Um, so Phragmites is, is a, it's a tall perennial grass. They, in some literature says five to 10 feet tall. We've certainly seen it in up around 15 feet tall and maybe even a little bit more. And it's, it's from Eurasia. It came over around, they believe, the 1800s in some ship ballast. You can see these flower heads on it. Right, right in this particular picture, they look a little fluffy. This is a little later in the season, probably around September. But uh, the plants typically bloom around July, early August, and, and like the reed canary grass, the, the seed heads will be a little tighter and, and more purple. Um, plant has uh, a ridiculous root system. It's just such a dense uh, rhizome layer. It can go several feet deep uh, into the soil. It's very dense at the soil, just below the soil surface across the, the stand of the plant. And it, it also produces these long runners off of, the, off of those rhizomes. I've, I've actually been in a shallow open water before, maybe with this plant growing along the margins on the edge of the water and, and be walking through and you'll, you'll find a root of Phragmites. Uh, I know for certain I found one about 20 feet away from the actual patch of the plant. So um, it's, it's a tough plant. It's wanting to spread, you know, it'll, it'll reach out and look for more soil or another place to grow one way or the other. And, and the problem with it in our wetlands is it just overtakes, it really crowds everything out. It, it takes up a lot of water and nutrients, uh, it affects the hydrology and the function of our, our wetlands. It, it grows very dense, restricts so much light from getting to the soil. Um, other plants just don't have a chance. And um, being that it's such a tall plant and senesces in the fall, it, it actually um, can really increase the potential for fire. I'm, I'm not sure if many people remember some of the great fires that occurred in Menor Marsh up, up in Lake County, but that was all Phragmites in winter. Um, it's just a lot of fuel. And when you take that risk of fire and say you do have some native plants trying to establish still, or especially some woody plants, and then all of a sudden all of this Phragmites catches on fire, um, it just wipes everything out. And this will kind of give you an idea just how dense it is when you go into a stand. Um, I was a member of one of our co-ops several years ago working to treat it. But here's the good news. Um, and going in and taking that plant out, this is actually uh, that same site that's been in the last several photos a couple years after treatment. We've got, we've, you know, treated the Phragmites and uh, had, you know, probably 90% control. And now we have, you know, sort of a, if you remove it, they will come type of thing. You know, these, some of these areas, it's just a matter of removing the bad actors and, and the good things are there. They just need a chance to come out. We have some nice button bush that's fruiting here, some native cattail. 
uh, some dogwood, certainly some nice sedges down at the, at the ground level. Um, but, but mostly uh, the herbicides are the chosen method. Uh, you know, a little bit of burning and mowing can be in falls too. So now I'll switch over to the to our despicable woody invasive plants. Um, I know I've listed a little more here than I believe I'm going to probably get to, but I'm going to try and hit these first five here. Um, so multiflora rose, I want to start with maybe an easy one. I think a lot of people are familiar with this plant. Um, if not, um, I can tell you it's a, so this rose is from, from China and Korea and or Japan. Uh, originally arrived in this country as a rootstock for our ornamental roses um, and is still uh, technically in use that way. Um, it was also heavily promoted at one time for growing a living fence, um, creating a, a fence row, creating wildlife habitat, was promoted as wildlife habitat. But it, it really is just such a nasty plant. And I think the photo here uh, with the green leaves, I can tell you was taken just about a week ago at Towner's Woods. It's a little cue that we have something growing in its not in its native ecosystem. It's got some green leaves right in the middle of a pretty tough winter day. The middle photo is a winter photo of the, the entire structure of, of one specimen. Really huge, impenetrable, nasty thing. And then if we look at the stem, we all know roses have thorns, but multi, multiflora rose uh, has a, a little interesting trait with its thorns. It, it likes to curl the thorns back down towards the ground that it came out of. So when you're walking through the woods and you happen to get snagged on one of these, if you go to yank your arm or your leg away in haste, it, it's more or less like yanking on the sharp end of a fish hook. And it just digs in a little deeper. It's certainly one that, um, just a, not one of my favorite plants whatsoever. Um, but it, it can invade really a lot of things. It doesn't, it does not like to grow with super wet feet, but it will grow in, in just nice, moist, rich soil, floodplain areas. Um, you know, it can get in there and shade out um, a lot of our native herbaceous plants and compete for space with our, our native woody understory species. Uh, likes old fields, gets out into reverting old fields, maybe that's trying to succeed back to, uh, to forest. Uh, you'll get this multiflora rose popping up and it slowly spreads around and, and um, easily spread by birds. It gets nice little rose hips. You'll see the really small little red fruits in the winter. Birds like to eat them. They're full of seeds. Um, mostly this plant uh, on a small scale, we, we actually do control it sometimes with pulling, believe it or not, if the plants are small and with some good heavy, heavy gloves and, and protective equipment, with smaller plants in, in say, a, a woodland setting, they sometimes pull fairly easily. But when we get into the heavier infestations or in a, uh, you know, when the plants are really dense, uh, we we typically try to get in and cut them at the base and treat the stumps with herbicide or um, you know, sometimes a foliar spray. Another, another woody invasive here uh, that we work with a lot is Ramnus or Frangula ulnus, uh, glossy buckthorn. This is another one. It's, it's really common. It's, it's re really just about everywhere but it, you know, still doing really bad things. It, it likes our swamps and, and uh, especially our bogs, our, our little jewels here that we have in Portage County, bogs and fens. It likes to really jump in and compete for space and alter our systems, reduce the diversity, shades things out. 
can see the one photo, the, the bark, kind of almost like a young cherry tree bark, dark, shiny bark with little light lenticels uh, spread up, up along the trunk or the stem. It's a prolific fruiting, fruiting plant, makes a lot of fruit, these nice little dark berries. I guess the, the shiny green ovate leaves. Um, don't believe that fruit is really all that nutritious for the birds, but birds, birds do eat it. Unfortunately, it also has somewhat of a laxative quality, so the bird doesn't get far before it's planted the seed uh, somewhere off-site. So this spreads really easily. Typically, we, we also treat this with, with cutting and treating the stump with herbicide. Get it, when, it, when it's not in a wetland setting and it's invading an old field, you know, it can be somewhat, uh, certainly not fully controlled, but you can control some spread with timely mowing, uh, getting in, keeping it mowed a couple times a year to keep it from making seed. Uh, but that uh, mowing, mowing is just not any way to really eliminate the plant. It's, it's going to stay there and keep trying to grow for a long time, even with repeated mowing. Uh, mowing in combination maybe with some prescribed fire to try and uh, kill some of the parent plants um, may be effective as an as a integrated approach. Um, then we'll move on here to um, Tree of Heaven. This is another one that has kind of been making the news a little bit lately. This plant's from China, it came over, I think the records say it came into Philadelphia, planted as an ornamental, can grow upwards around 80 feet tall. Um, Somewhat easy to confuse at times with our native sumacs, and the leaves also look somewhat like our our, our black walnuts. So each leaf is this, you know, this this long compound pinnate leaf. Uh, they can they can be really long. They can be like a foot. They say up to four feet. I don't know. I'm not sure. I've seen one four feet, but I certainly believe it. And each one has about you know, 10 to 40 leaflets on each one, uh, really thick twigged alternate leaves. A, a big clue to the ID along with this kind of light tannish gray bark. Uh, if you crush a leaf up or break the stem, it will, it, almost all parts of the plant have this kind of burned peanut butter smell. That, uh, and burned to the point of being more uh, pretty offensive odor. I see it a lot along um, our hike and bike trails. Definitely seems to spread with railroads, uh, probably by wind dispersal. And what's well, kind of been in the news lately is we're also faced now with um, the spotted lanternfly, which is really going to be a huge threat to our our forests and some of our commercial crops. Um, this, you know, this this species feeds on um, grapes and, and walnut trees and, and uh, sugar maple trees. You know, can, and can really do some serious damage to those crops. Well, it's also from from the east, and now that it's here, it's recognized its old friend tree of heaven from back home. It, it really likes to lay its eggs on tree of heaven. So uh, this species is now following uh, the invasive plant tree of heaven uh, along the same uh, invasive pattern where there's tree of heaven. This, this species is kind of finding it and moving along uh, western westerly into our country. Um, our next one here, uh, Oriental Bittersweet. Um, this is boy, just re really a nasty one. Uh, it's 
came from Asia, Korea, China, uh, brought over as an ornamental. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's still cultivated to some extent today and used in landscaping. Um, and it, it causes a lot of problems, really. Um, for one, it's, it's displacing our native bittersweet, uh, Celaster scandens. And worse yet, it's hybridizing with it also. So our, our native bittersweet's slowly becoming pretty imperiled because of that. The difference between our native and, and this uh, invasive bittersweet, the oriental bittersweet um, has more rounded leaves. The fruit stays a little closer to the stem, but it makes a lot of fruit, really heavy fruiting species. Our, our native bittersweet has leaves that are a little bit more football shaped. Um, it doesn't produce as much fruit, but the fruit um, does reach out usually as far as the leaves. So that's kind of an ID tip. Um, but it, it really causes, you know, along with threatening our native plant, it, when it's out on the site, it can cause a lot of trouble. Uh, the old fields, wood edges, the edges of forests, forest openings, um, likes to climb up or climb up on trees and wrap around them in a spiral fashion and um, actually begins to more or less girdle the tree from bottom to top. And then when you couple that with the fact once it does reach the top it produces a lot of foliage and seeds up in the canopy of the tree. So now uh, you have a, a weakened tree now with all this heavy weight up at the top. Um, so it's much more susceptible to wind damage and breakage. But it can be really, really dense, almost just impenetrable when it's more um, in the shrub layer. Certainly restricts some mobility for wildlife and humans. And I chose it to be the most despicable one uh, of the talk here for tonight. Uh, interesting thing about this photo, this here is at Towner's Woods about five years ago. Other than the taller trees, almost everything you're seeing here is an invasive species, most of which is oriental bittersweet. Um, but interestingly enough, at, at the base, uh, right at the ground level, the lower growing vegetation there is multiflora rose covered with oriental bittersweet. And then the oriental bittersweet climbing up into the canopies of our native trees. <coughs> Just a nasty, nasty setup there, but we've we've worked on it since. And then, then the last uh, woody invasive I'm going to talk about here is another fairly common one, but I like to mention it. Um, can jump out in and really take over disturbed sites, our old fields, and inhibit our uh, you know, reversion of some of the old fields and keeping the native plants out. It's the autumn olive. This was um, the autumn olive is, is native to China. Uh, it was brought over as an ornamental and then also later recommended by some of our own agencies for wildlife habitat and windbreak plantings. It was uh, used very heavily in reclamation efforts after uh, you know, large scale mining. <clears throat> it's a heavy fruit producer. Um, as you have late summer, it has these um, little orangish red fruits on it with, with shiny little orange dots, if you can see that in the photo heavy, heavy fruiting, kind of a kind of velvety stem. The leaves are a darker green on top and kind of a almost like white uh, waxy color on the backside. When you look at the mature plant in the middle of the photo, um, you can kind of see this is probably a, a early summer photo with some, uh, some of the light yellow blooms on the plant. And then the, to make things worse, um, as I said, the, uh, the fruit's edible. <laughs> it's tolerable late in the season, late summer, uh, maybe when it starts to cool down, gets a, but uh, more or less, it's kind of like 
sometimes like just taking a big teaspoon of alum and putting it on your tongue, it just puckers your mouth up. It also gets some thorns up in that photo to the right. And it doesn't typically have a lot of thorns on each plant, but, but it does have some that it has uh, just not enough that say if you, as we have done trying to climb under like this, this specimen here in the middle photo to, to cut the stump, you'll usually find that one thorn with, the, with your shoulder or your back or the side of your face, um, just awful nasty things. But this, this plant too, typically we, we cut it down and treat the stumps, maybe the smaller uh, shrubs. We, we can treat with a foliar herbicide. Um, we've had pretty, really good success controlling this, this shrub with prescribed fire. So um, when, we, when we do have it in say a reverting field where there's enough uh, herbaceous fuel in the, in the fall or spring to, to have a prescribed burn go through, um, at least in my case, I found that this plant's pretty susceptible. When you get a fire burning around the base of this tree and blistering up that bark, it can really be devastating to this plant. So that's, that's a nice tool to have for controlling this plant. Um, here, that kind of concludes what I had for the woody plants. My, my, my last thing I really wanted to talk about a little bit was um, Something I, I've struggled with some in my career, you know, I, like I said, this invasive plants really came to the forefront just, just before I started my career. And it took me a long time. Um, the more I, I learned about these and, and the more different invasive plants that I learned to recognize, you know, it doesn't take long in this field to, to start to feel really discouraged. Um, you, the more you know, the more you drive down the road and you see these things everywhere. And, and I think other people go through the same thing. It takes a while to, you know, you've learned it and you recognize it now. And now all of a sudden you're recognizing it everywhere. And it almost uh, can start to take your gumption away a little bit. And, and, you, and so you, you, you have to rebound and, and still remember we want to fight the good fight. Most of these invasive plants, all of the ones I've talked about tonight, they, they are here and they are here to stay. And, and there's many, many more that are the same situation. What's important with these plants is just to remember, we're, we're not going to eliminate them. They're, they're here. Um, but we certainly want to protect um, our, our more precious resources. Um, and that's kind of how, how I prioritize when, when managing these, these more or less common invasive species. Um, we really look at the resources we're trying to protect. Um, if you'll see on this chart here, we have you know, one axis, the conservation value of a particular site or a system or habitat that you're managing. If it has a low or high conservation value uh, potential for rare or high quality species, and the other axis we have disturbances in the site. Does it have little disturbance or is it highly degraded? Um, where it's going to be really difficult to ever return to normal form. And so I ran across this some years ago and I really kind of adopted it uh, as our management philosophy uh, here at Portage Parks. We, we have some really nice things. We have some really nice bogs and some uh, nice habitats, some really nice woods that, that have, uh, if they don't have rare or threatened species, they certainly have uh, wonderful biodiversity of some very rich species, quality native plant species. So those areas um, are really the first thing we think about when we prioritize where we're going to worry about invasive plants. We really need to keep those clean. If, if they are clean and the good things are there and we want to preserve them, that needs to be the first place that we work. And so if you follow the chart, then we have a site that you know, really has high conservation value. Um, it's also highly disturbed, you know, 
uh, that's also becomes maybe the, the next or the third priority. We want to improve those sites. Um, so we really start, and I always kind of compare it to, to a wildfire, almost, I don't know if you would say like reverse of fighting a wildfire, um, except we're trying to make our fire line around the good thing and then fight outward into the fire. Um, so that's how we really look at it. I, I certainly encourage the more the better if, if um, you know, it's, it's really important. If everybody works to make, make their own little uh, patch better, I encourage everybody to control invasive plants at home uh, on your own property. Um, because cumulatively, um, it does, does improve things on the whole. Um, and don't get discouraged. And we've worked on some really heavily invaded sites. And if you, you just work in patchwork and, and start small before you think big and just have some success, it's a lot more rewarding to start there and, and work outwards. <laughs>